Hi everyone and welcome to Magic Numbers. This is the episode 13, so clearly the very good for the Innistrad theme uh, as everything is circling around the number 13. Um, I'm going to switch on my laser pointer and today we're doing the first dive at the 17 lands data uh, from Crimson Vow. And what I'm going to be looking at is basic stats from the format, uh, very much following the same um, design as I did for the Midnight Hunt, if any of you saw that. And then we're going to look also at which cards make the archetypes tick and which cards don't make the archetypes tick. And by doing that, we're also going to sort of see if particular archetypes are mm, as with what C intended or not. So basically, is the theme that the archetype is supposed to be supporting uh, supported well enough for it to be successful? Or maybe it's a trap and you should try to find different builds of the um, of this archetype. Now, this is a very cursory first look, so uh, I'm not going to go deep into sub builds. That will happen later in the format, but um, but we at least will get a good idea of what's going on in which archetype and which cards are essential and which cards are not so essential or even quite detrimental. But without thank you for the sub, Carl. Thank you for being here also. Um, so I decided that I will start my seminars with something more loosely related, but um, but that gives time for people to join the chat so I don't have to repeat myself when there is uh, uh, other people um, joining because, you know, usually the beginning of the stream is the uh, time, like first 15 minutes when people start coming in and then there we have the, let's call it full audience of uh, 25. Um, so what I want to start is, what I want to start with is a bit of a chat about Boomer Magic, because <laughs> I know it's a bit of a meme, but recently we've been uh, hearing talking about Boomer Magic, especially in relation to the limited um, uh, and the Zoomer uh, drafting strategies. And, you know, last several sets, the Zoomers were uh, basically right. So... Um, limited changed in the last four years, let's say. Uh, things that were considered quite canonical, like one drops are bad, um, you have to have card draw because that gives you advantage. Those became sort of obsolete. And here we have this format when all of a sudden those things come back and seem to be pretty good, like hard removal is excellent. Again, uh, card draw spells are pretty good. The four mana four fours are becoming like Pretty good. Um, and that made me think, okay, so maybe the so-called boomer magic is not really a playstyle that was wrong, as some have suggested. It's not that uh, the boomers were wrong and, and, and they played the magic wrong and, and, and now the zoomers came and discovered some new ways of playing magic that are better than the old ways. It's just that <clears throat> the sets four years ago, five years ago, six years ago, were designed in such a way that what is called boomer magic was the optimal way of playing. And I think that we see a slight revival of that play in this set because it's been designed to be like that. This set was designed to cater to the old play style, small incremental advantage, slightly mid-rangey decks and things like that. So there is no such thing as boomer magic or zoomer magic. There is efficient ways of playing particular formats. And it so happened that in the last several formats, the so-called Zoomer magic was pretty good. And I think that in this format, as we will see, the Boomer style of playing is going to be successful, which means that you shouldn't complain about Boomer magic or Zoomer magic. You should complain about people getting too stuck in their way ways of playing and not being flexible enough to change their game style into the uh, prefer preferred version of the given set. And I know, of course, it's difficult to change your way of playing. I have problems with that because some sets just don't fit my style, my style of playing. I think this one might be one of those, for example. Um, but we shouldn't like look at it as, okay, this is there is a right or wrong way of playing that is universal. I think that generally the problem is lack of flexibility. And I'm pretty sure that several Zoomers that are used to the last four years because that's where they developed as players will have problems in uh, this set because they will basically 
try the same things as they did in the last seven sets and it will not work and it will get them frustrated, which makes me feel for some boomer who played, I don't know, 40, 50 sets with the uh, particular play style uh, that was um, successful then. And now they're coming to those new sets and, and they cannot find their spot because they would have to completely reevaluate how they play. And, you know, after 40 sets of playing, it's maybe not the easiest thing to do for everyone. <coughs> Sorry, oh, I have some frog in my throat. So that's one part of my uh, preamble. The other hypothesis I want to post, I'm not going to answer this one in this seminar, but I want to post the hypothesis because again, a soapbox moment for me, data is useful, but data analyzed without any kind of forethought is not that useful. I mean, when I look at the analyses, are they wrong or are they right? Are they good and well, well made? It doesn't matter. But I always start with some questions that I ask myself and I try to answer those questions. And then I find, look at the data and sit down and stare at the screen and, and think, okay, how can I tackle that particular question? Which data sets would be useful for that? How can I achieve this? And how can I make a metric that is telling and at the same time understandable for, uh, for the audience that is not necessarily versed in maths and at the same time passable for people that are really good at math. This is the problems that I usually struggle with in terms of making any kind of analysis. Now, for this format, my sort of pet hypothesis, because beginning of the format was really tricky and there was a lot of um, people that couldn't find their winning ways, even though they are normally posting really high uh, win rates. And I was thinking that, of course, I'm pretty sure it's a compound problem and I'm sure that there is multiple answers uh, to that question. But one thing that I sort of hypothesize is that early draft people were just picking um, a lot of, um, especially two drops because these tend to be the synergistic cards um, uh, uh, in this particular set. They were picking two drops because they know that they need two drops in their deck, but they were picking those two drops willy nilly. And we're going to see some of them in the data, uh, not only the red ones, but uh, in every color pair, really. Uh, some of those two drops are really good in one archetype and really poor in the other archetypes. Now, in the matured uh, limited format, people will know that, okay, Hungry Ridge Wolf is not really that great uh, outside of uh, green, red. But in the early format, they think, okay, maybe I'll get a couple of other red wolves and that's going to be enough. Probably it's not going to be enough. I mean, we're going to look at some data for some of those two drops and we'll see that in some cases, they are just not good enough when they are outside of their planned archetype. And because people were taking those two drops uh, quite a lot, people who were in the color pair that needs that, that particular two drop did not have access to it. So their deck was also getting weaker because they had to compete for the card that they shouldn't be competing. So my idea is that hopefully after a couple of weeks of the format, when people figure out which two drop goes well in their deck, um, the drafting will become slightly more synergistic and slightly less chaotic because if you identify correctly that green uh, red is open, you're going to get all those hungry ritual from the, uh, from the pod because red, white people are not going to be uh, particularly interested in picking that card. Okay, there is my preamble, and now we can go straight to the data. For which, by the way, I'm really grateful to Viral Misnomer, who it took him 15 seconds to send me the data set after I asked him, which was uh, incredible, amazing, and awesome. Okay, so this time around, we have around 108,000 games that I took into account. I did a lot of trimming of the data. I didn't look at totality of it because I decided I'm going to focus only on two color archetypes. Um, so I trimmed everything that was monocolored or three colors, just not to cause confusion in the data uh, from the 17 lands player side. Uh, this means that it was roughly 17,700 drafts. It's slightly smaller data set than uh, the mid one uh, from the first week, because I think we got the data one day earlier. So probably by now the numbers are sort of the same. So people play the same. One big difference is that um, both the win rate and the trophy rate are markedly lower than they were in the Midnight Hunt. 
so uh, the win rate of 17 land users was 56.5% in Midnight Hunt. Now it's down to 54. And trophy rate also dropped by three percentage points from 16 to 13% roughly. Um, which actually is normal. It's not that this set is particularly weird in terms of the uh, win rate. It's more that uh, Midnight Hunt had a, a thing pretty significantly higher win rate from the 17 lands users. And I think it was very similar also in um, Adventures in Forgotten Realms. And I think that this was a result of one deck or a couple of decks being really open in the first weeks and uh, people who were invested being able to exploit that uh, very early. So um, part of that effect is just that right now there is just no really open uh, and successful deck um, in any pods per default. While um, in Midnight Hunt you could just basically force blue black in the first week and you yeah, and you would win uh, quite a lot more than you would have if, if the black uh, blue was more challenged. So these are just the numbers so that you know at what scale are we operating so you can you know draw your own conclusions whether the data is um, um, telling or, or still in the shambles. And I can tell you that some sample sizes are pretty small and I'm going to indicate uh, in particular where the data should be treated with a grain of salt. Right, so let's start first with the first um, first um, basic statistic. And this is the number of graphs per each archetype. And what I want you to draw your attention to is that basically the top five drafted archetypes are all in the friendly colors. And for those that are maybe newer to magic, friendly colors, if you look at the back of the cards, if the two colors are next to each other on this uh, pentagon uh, that is on the back of the card. If they are next to each other, they are called friendly colors from you know, old school magic when uh, multicolor cards only existed in friendly colors, really. Um, and white black is the only um, enemy color uh, archetype that is actually drafted almost at the level of the friendly color pairs, but all the other four um, uh, archetypes that are uh, in the enemy colors are markedly lower in terms of being drafted than um, than the friendly color pairs. What does it make? It, it, it's sort of like a pseudo Strixhaven. Uh, it seems that either people think, or it truly is, that um, the enemy color pairs are slightly less supported, like niche archetypes. Um, maybe something you can compare to Ikoria in a way, um, that basically particular sets of color pairs are more supported. Some of them are not uh, are a bit less supported. Like in um, in Ikoria, you had, the, for instance, the green-white Vigilance deck. It was not very supported, but once in a while it came together and you could draft the color pair uh, if you wanted to, uh, which results in a disproportion. Not as hardcore as in Strixhaven when you basically had no drafts in the color pairs that were not supported by the um, by the colleges or like in Guilds of Ravnica or uh, um, or Ravnica Allegiance where you basically were told look these are the color pairs we support you have multicolor cards in them and uh, uh, just draft them here you have some support but it's not as strong as for the uh, friendly color pairs so keep that in mind when you're drafting that uh, uh, a, friendly colors are going to be more contested, probably. Uh, B, um, unfriendly colors, uh, enemy colors are a bit less supported. So you have this decision that you make. Okay, should I try to go into the um, enemy color pair, knowing that there is a higher pro probability of uh, no one drafting this combination uh, at the pod? So for instance, that means I have a higher chance of, of, of getting a signpost uncommon if, the, if, if, if I feel that the color is open. Or should I try to contest the um, um, allied color pairs, uh, knowing that there's a higher chance that there is someone at the pod who is also trying to do that? And I'm sure that in this format, we're going to have a, some return to the reading the signals episode. Um, maybe when the draft data will become available with a pick order and, and what should be considered a signal and not in which particular archetype. Uh, okay. 
So the win rate by archetype. And um, this format is pretty well balanced, I would say. So yes, we do have those two higher winners. Both of them are in, uh, also in friendly pairs, which is interesting. Um, uh, and basically that's uh, vampires and werewolves. They are slightly above any, anything else. Then there's the chaser group from Is It, And then we have like a big, big pile of uh, uh, Boros, Orzhov, um, uh, Golgari, Demir, Azorius, that are sort of done at the average win rate level. And two archetypes that are lagging slightly behind are uh, white green and blue green. They still have the positive win rate, but blue green seems markedly weaker than, than, than the rest. So uh, that's, yeah. Uh, as Hyder36 um, promptly noticed, all of the top four are containing red, which makes me think red is the best color in the draft. And if you look at the um, rest of the data, all the black archetypes are inside of the uh, larger successful group. So black should be the second best color in the uh, in the format in terms, at least that's what the data suggests. Um, and then we see like uh, basically band colors are not particularly good. They are slightly lagging behind. It might be also a shadow shadow cloak is mentioning that it's crazy how often red is still open and that might be one of the things that might be one of the things that people are traumatized with the midnight hunt and they are not picking red as highly as they should but it also was it might be not only the trauma of midnight hunt most of the content creators before the format was released also were saying that red looks like a weaker of the colors and that turned out to be very much not true Um, but yeah, good to know that, um, you know, vampires and werewolves, best archetypes, try to, uh, avoid blue green. One more interesting thing is that, um, Dimir, Azorius and Selesnya are heavier contested, uh, and yet they don't post good numbers. So you should maybe think pretty hard if the colors are open and, and don't go into them, don't try to force them because you know that people are, especially the mirror was the most drafted, um, uh, archetype in the first week and it doesn't have good numbers. So it's a combination of heavily contested because people wanted to do exploit stuff, I guess, and not posting particularly promising results. It's not that it's bad. It's just that it's not very strong. So you have to really make sure that you're uh, entering it unopposed um, if you want to make a Timir deck, I think. Uh, Gersai says, I have been following the win rates daily and never saw this comparison on 17 lands. There is an additional filter for this analysis. I'm working on the raw data. I basically get the data from 17 lands um, and analyze them myself. Um, and the top two are also the ones where the archetype kind of works. That Daedalus United, yes, and I agree. Uh, I think that uh, you will see that in the you will see that in the um, in the archetype comparisons. We will see exactly where the archetype seems to work because you will see that from the cards. It's not going to be like 100% clear picture, but you will get a very good impression of that. Uh, the average win rate of the 17 lens user is 54.3% uh, washer dryer. So yeah, it's slightly lower than in mid, but mid was exceptionally high. Um, probably driven by, by, by blue being open and, and users of uh, 17 lens identifying it very early. 50.43 is roughly on par with what you would expect from a set from the uh, 17 lens users. And you have to keep in mind that the, I think the number of users is growing, uh, viral misnomer can correct me, but I'm pretty sure that it is growing. Um, so with growing pace, you should get maybe a slight decline in the win rate. So the fact that it stays at around 54 and a half, like it always did, is pretty encouraging. 
Okay, so that's one thing. Um, win rate by archetype. I also looked at the win rate difference on play and draw. So basically, traditionally in most formats, you will win more when you are on the play than when you are on the draw. Being on the draw is a disadvantage, especially in best of one. Oh, by the way, this data is all best of one. Uh, but some colors are uh, more punished than the others. And um, as much as red is very uh, good at winning, it's also a bit more, I don't want to say punished for being uh, on a draw. It might be that it's uh, promoted for being on the play. So uh, decks that contain red, I think, are better at starting games in general, which of course will lead to the fact that they will, um, they will um, have a bigger difference in win rate uh, if, if, if they are on the draw. And um, and uh, the whole bunch of color combinations here, it's just like what you would normally expect around 4%. Like 6% is a 6.7 6, 6 percentage points difference between being on the play and being on the draw is quite large. Uh, so red green is really benefiting from being on the play and which means that you also should try to build it as if it was benefiting from being on the play. But if I remember correctly, the win rate on the draw is not bad. It's just that win rate on the play is really, really good. It's at like, I think 59% uh, uh, on the play and 53 on the draw or something like that. This is the interesting thing. I did it already in the previous one. Um, obviously games last some time, uh, but uh, in a single archetype, the win does not necessarily last the same time as uh, a loss. So some decks are quick to win, but slow to lose. And some decks are uh, slow to win, but quick to lose. So if they don't win, they, don't, they, they, they lose pretty quickly. If they win, they, they, uh, they take their time. And in this format, I find this quite amazing, to be fair. Uh, there is this completely inverse uh, sort of like cross um, uh, relation. So the decks that are slow in winning, um, like Selesnya is, like Blue Green is, are also very fast to lose. So uh, basically they, they, uh, they lose if they don't stabilize very early. But the decks that are quick to win, like, uh, like the two that are, um, uh, like the uh, Gruul and, and, and Rakdos, they win pretty quickly, but it also takes a long time to, to, to win with them. So they have the staying power even in the longer games. Uh, and this is, you know, you may think, oh, but probably this is normal. This is at least not 100% normal because the same graph for uh, Midnight Hunt looked very different. We did have the uh, differences between slow decks in terms of how, how quickly they win and, and, and fast decks. But in terms of how quickly they lost, there was almost no like significant trend. So basically all types of decks lost at a roughly same speed, uh, while there was a difference in speed of winning between some of them. So uh, that's different from this one. Uh, and here we see that there is a clear, clear trend uh, on uh, that it's a um, um, negative correlation between speed of winning and, and, and speed of losing. So that's something that was Pretty interesting. I still don't know where to go with it, uh, but it's definitely worth noting. And from the same data, basically, um, I plotted the archetypes by win rate and um, I uh, sort of uh, regressed the win rate with uh, the game average win length. And basically you see like almost a perfect correlation here as well. So the decks that are faster to win have higher win rate which suggests to me that this format wants to win fast. And there might be very, um, uh, very reason for that. Uh, but one of them is the faster you win, the smaller the chance that you're going to be slaughtered by some bomb. And I think that this might be the case in this one. Uh, basically you want to kill as quickly as you can, because if you don't, you might just uh, uh, um, get slammed with the breakfast demon uh, that will end the game because you don't have a way of dealing with it at the particular moment. And, and, and then you have like three, six, six flyers attacking you. So, uh, that might be, there might be other reasons as well, but, uh, 
this is a pretty strong correlation and i'm pretty sure that this one is a significant correlation between the win rate and and the length of the game oh. so another thing that is um worth knowing is that best of one is the format where you should mulligan much less um but not every single deck uh, mulligans in the same way and um, it's worth knowing that uh, some of them are slightly better or worse in, in, in getting mulligan. Here, I think that uh, the, main, the main thing to take away is that the decks that mulligan less all have access to black or red, except for white red for some weird reason. But um, uh, the decks that mulligan less have uh, lower access to, uh, have access to black and red, which makes me think that it's blood that um, uh, helps to fix draws with a notable exception of white red and uh, you know again here there might be several explanations for that one would include you need like a good set of early drops in white red if you want to win and if you don't get it then you probably have to mulligan that hand and that results in slightly higher uh, mulligan rate it's also worth noting that it has markedly smaller sample size than the uh, friendly color per deck so maybe this number is not a real number maybe it's also slightly lower Devils United, is the life gain white causing aberration in the data? Uh, what do you mean by that in terms of... We'll come back when you when you go with the follow-up, but um, yeah, if you could specify what, what type of aberration would you expect from life gain in, in, in white, then, then I would be happy to answer. Um, so, yeah, I mean, the mulligan rates are between 13% and 11%, and... Mulliganing rate was actually significant, or not significant. It was it was slightly lower in um, in uh, Midnight Hunt, but it was also higher in some cases. So uh, yeah, but bas basically, majority of the archetypes were actually quite lower in terms of their uh, Mulligan rate in Midnight Hunt. Um, again, I don't have a good answer for that, um, but uh, it's worth noting that people are more trigger happy in terms of mulliganing it might be you know that people play four drops more in this format and because if you play more four drops you might end up with an opening hand that has like three four drops and three lands and, and whatever um you may uh you may end up mulliganing i think that's uh and fire misnomer did this really nice analysis i think it might be to have something to do with people so if you have rummaging or, or, or draw smoothing effects in your deck, the intuition of many people, and that included me some couple of years ago, uh, is to trim lands because you say, well, I have, I, have, I have draw smoothing. I can just put fewer lands because I'm going to smooth my draws and I'm going to uh, draw the missing lands. But in fact, I think that the proper uh, play pattern is actually to put more lands. And uh, there is data that suggests, I'm not going to say that it definitively proves it, but uh, it strongly suggests that um, uh, actually when you have a lot of blood payoffs, you can play 18 lands, no problem. And then you will mulligan much less. Uh, but I think some people have this tendency of putting 16 lands and I didn't test it so uh, stringently as uh, Viral Misnomer did. Um, but they will put 16 lands, for example, uh, because they think that their blood will fix the draws for them. But the um, problem with that kind of thinking is that it's easier to play your lands, maybe miss one creature drop and then uh, smooth your draw afterwards and have gas in the later game, than to stop your early essential creature plays because you have to uh, sacrifice blood um, uh, to get your lands. And you also have to discard valuable spells to get your lands. Much better to discard lands to get valuable spells when you have the uh, enough uh, mana for for what you need to do in your deck uh game length to win or lose um i don't know i i i don't think that i would have to i would have to test it basically i would have to test it um but um the games are slightly longer and that might be the case that might be the case 
Exactly. Oh yeah, very good point, uh, viral misnomer. I think that the easiest way I think about it, you don't need spells to play your lands, but you need lands to play your spells. There you go. Um, it can be, but it also can be the due to the DK tokens that Alus United. It can be also because um, you know a couple of people said that uh, playing mid, it felt like you start at sixteen life because someone will have those two uh, DK tokens that will ping you for two for nothing basically, um, and it might be the mixture of those facts. The differences are not very large in terms of the game length so um, you know uh, they're slight which makes sense because you know the life gain will be focused in green white and green bl and white black uh so probably those wouldn't have like a massive impact on the game length of all the archetypes in all the pairs because that's like only we're talking about uh what 20 percent of decks maybe Uh, Gersai says my default land count for arena best of one is 16 lands because of the hand smoother. Is there any general data about that? I did a seminar about it, but um, it got lost in the because I didn't um, archive it uh, before I went on holiday. Therefore, I'm going to definitely in a cucumber season, I'm going to repeat the hand smoother uh, seminar and redo it yet again then do you have all the data that is needed but i i have uh, several threads on twitter that deal with hand smoothing i'm pretty sure if you like look in twitter sherkovitz and uh, hand smoother you will find them and then you have all the numbers about how the smoother works and and what does it mean if you have 16 17 or 18 lands so you should be able to find those right uh Next thing that I want to talk briefly, very briefly, is mulligan penalty. Um, basically, it tells you what, how much in percentage points you lose from your win rate when you mulligan in different archetypes. And um, yeah, there is some differences between the archetypes. Again, the white red, which also mulligans the most, has the biggest penalty for mulligan. So I think that uh, you know the. If people learn how to build better white red decks that mulligan slightly less, the win rate of the archetype will also go up because they actually lose the most from uh, mulliganing. So uh, if you play white red, probably it would be worth thinking about uh, making a deck in such a way that you mulligan as 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 little as possible because you will actually lose seventeen point seven percentage points uh, of your win rate if you mulligan. Um. And yeah, in general, just 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 think to build your decks in such a way that, yes, under Carlos T, uh, that's my motto: never mulligan. I mulligan pretty rarely. I think I'm below the average. I'm, my mulligan rate is seven six percent or something. I really need to have a good reason for mulliganing. And I will keep two landers, no problem. I'd rather. I I, I don't have a problem with that. That uh, you know, like twenty percent of the time, I'm I'm I'm. I'm going to do something wrong, but uh, the fact that I don't mulligan uh, seven times when I could have and, and, and win is, is, is beneficial for my win rate, I assume. So yeah, but it's also important that if you build your decks correctly, and I think that best of one deck building needs to take account for the hand smoother, but not necessarily by trimming lands. I think that that can be risky, uh, Gersai, uh, coming back to your question. 17 lands is still the number that you probably should consider unless there is something special going on in your deck. Um, if you build your deck with the right mixture of uh, expensive and cheap spells, uh, you will minimize the uh, odds of mulliganing. And yeah, especially the mulligan penalty is quite high in best of one because the opponent has a smooth hand. Yeah. Exactly. You can always say that you've kept worse and uh, worst hand ever snap keep is probably better than, than, than mulliganing a medium hand. I think that this is also something... Mulliganing is very different between limited and constructed. I think part of my struggles in constructed is that I'm terrified of mulliganing and in constructed you should because you build your deck very consistently and if you have like a 
mediocre hand, you're going to probably play with someone that has a decent hand. No chance. It's better to lose one card because you're going to get your synergies that you probably put in your deck. So I think that this is the difference. In limited, mulliganing is very punishing and um, and you should take that into account when you're building your deck, that you want to avoid them at all costs and build the mana curve that will survive on two lands in most cases. And you have to keep in mind, with Smoother, 60% of the time you get free lands in your opening hand, roughly. 55, I think that's the number. And uh, Mercuria, who I welcome very cordially to the uh, seminar, mentioned that evolving wild into color decks is important. Again, Viral Misnomer did a fantastic thread about it from Midnight Hunt. I'm pretty sure that the conclusions stand uh, for this set. Evolving wild is a very good card because it can fix your colors. Because uh, the quantity of the lands is maybe not even as big of a problem as the quality of them. Because color screw is real and it will happen uh, even if you have those three lands. Uh, oh, thank you very much. That uh, viral misnomer put the thread in the chat. You can get yourself acquainted with it. I think it's a solid piece of work there. And the last thing from the the last thing from the state of the format um, uh, part of the seminar is the um, win rates against particular archetypes. And this is where the data is based sometimes on pretty low, um, on pretty low uh, sample sizes. So uh, be wary of some of those numbers. Like this number is probably just a fluke because these are very not played archetype blue, green, and, and, and white, red. So probably, you know, there's a huge possibility that this is only due to variance. But what do we see on this square? Uh, we basically see the win rates of the 17 lands users against op opponents playing particular combination of a two color deck. Um, so for example, if a 17 lands user played black, red, and was paired against someone playing white, red, they had 60.1% win rate, which means that black red is dealing pretty well with white red. Uh, however, black red is not dealing very well with the red green. That's its probably weakest matchup. And same red green is pretty good against blue red, but it's not doing very well against the black green. And not, you know, uh, you can see here that. Um, this, this is the interesting one. 17 lands users actually lose their mirror matchups against them um, in, in, in Azorius and in uh, Boros, but they are having positive win rate and all the other. Now, keep in mind that these numbers are, again, especially with the enemy colors, are based on quite small, uh, um, quite small uh, sample sizes. So uh, approach this data with caution, but uh, you can see some trends. Like for instance, blue-green is really bad against white decks. And I think that this is a, a good pointer. Uh, you could imagine that blue-green normally doesn't have too much interaction, especially kill spells. And this is really great for white because white can just load their training creatures with um, with counters. They have those pesky evasive flyers um, that, that can grow with the game. and Blue green does not necessarily deal with that. It probably deals slightly better with like large chunky uh, bombs because they can either counter them because they already have mana uh, freed up or they can bounce them, freeze them, whatever. Uh, has 17 has been saying blue is a bad color because um, I got past Hullbreaker twice last night. Once Pack two, pick three. The other time, pack two, pick five. Hallbreaker Horror is the massive uh, flash seven eight that uh, basically, if it sticks to the board for a couple of turns, it just bounces everything that the opponent played and and dominates the game. Um, well, definitely. Uh, I actually no, I'm not gonna say definitely because I don't know the stats of um of Hallbreaker Horror, but I assume that Hallbreaker Horror itself has pretty good win rate. Um, the data, uh, 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 
uh, does suggest that blue is not the strongest color. It's probably like, I would say that basically all the band colors are roughly equal uh, and they are in the weaker half of the colors. I'm not going to guess which one is the poorest of the one. Um, so yeah, there you go. It shouldn't tell them that it's such a poor color that you shouldn't draft. This is best of one numbers rainfall. This is all best of one numbers. Okay, so we're done with the first half, which is probably first one third of the seminar, because now we're going to the, the lovely world of trying to figure out by numbers of what are the archetypes that Wotzi gave us good in doing. So basically, um, I'm going to show you three graphs for each archetype. First graph, it just shows you the success rate. It's going to be the very boring graph, but it just gives you the background against others. We might move between them and just compare the numbers in some cases. And I divided the decks in three categories. They are very arbitrary, but I defined successful decks as the ones that have five and more wins, because at five wins, you get your gems back with extras. Um, so basically if you have five wins or more, you probably are happy with your draft because you got your gems back. Then there's the middling ones where you get some gems back, but not exactly all of them with four wins in late in the format with the rares, you can actually get to the, um, 1,500 gems, but not always. So I call them middling and fails are the zero to win draft because there you just think your gems into something that didn't work. So as I said arbitrary division, but you have to make some arbitrary divisions. And um, we can look at the numbers here. Uh, so basically in black red, 35% of the decks were successful, uh, around 27, 28% were middling and 37 were fail. So this is the bet. So I put the archetypes in the order of win rate because I thought maybe in the beginning it's going to be a bit rusty in terms of explaining the data and uh, successful archetypes are probably more intuitively understood by people because they play them and they win with them. So clearly they know how they should be operating. So there should be less surprising uh, data in those. And as we descend, uh, we're going to get to the archetypes that the users clearly don't know how to build yet. So we're going to look at the uh, numbers there and try to figure out what are the interesting cards um, in, 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 in those decks. Do you have the overall deck performance numbers? You mean the win rate, Shadow Cloak? Uh, the win rates we talked about them in the beginning, these are the numbers. So basically it starts with black red, that's why we're going to talk about black red now at 56.6% of the 7 million users. And the blue green is the lowest with 51.6. Uh, I hope that this is the one what you wanted. And you have this big pile of decks in the middle that have roughly the same win rates. So there's not much difference between them. Uh, okay, I don't know Carva. Some of them might be bad. Some of them might be not figured out. Um, I guess that we're going to try to um, look at how counterintuitive are the good cards and how counterintuitive are the bad cards to see. I am assuming that the ones that are the easiest to figure out are the ones that do exactly what Watsi plans for them and the ones that are not um, figured out are the ones where the cards that are supposed to be good in them are not good in them and cards that are supposed to be whatever are good. We're going to see a couple of examples of those as well. And then we have the standout cards and the, how do they call them? Underperformers. So standout cards will be uh, measured by a difference between an average number of a given card between successful decks and failed decks. So in this hypothetical example, I take all the decks with five wins or more from that archetype and all the decks with the uh, two and fewer wins. And I basically count the average number of each card in, uh, in a deck, including the decks that don't have them. This is important. So, you know, I might get like, Oh, on average, I have 0.3 of this card per deck uh, in it. Yeah. 
Yes, you remember it from mid because it's exactly the same analysis. I just slightly changed it, tweaked it, maybe that to make the... Yeah, exactly. So yeah, if I have like an average 1.2 of card X in, uh, in my blue-green deck, in the successful ones, and 0.9 of that card in, um, in the failing decks, the difference is 0.3 cards, so I, uh, I changed it to 30 percentage points of a card, basically. And that's how the data is going to look like. So just to, just to show you, for example, here we have the outstanding cards for black-red. Uh, this means that there's 0.2 Black Tithe Harvester more in um, in the successful decks than, than in the uh, failed decks. And these differences seem pretty small, but um, they are actually quite big differences. So it's worth noticing them and thinking about what that means for the deck. So the two outstanding cards in the Black Red from that data seem to be uh, Black Tithe Harvester and Abrade. Mark also Blood Death Harvester is an uncommon, which is rarer. So having a lot more of a particular uncommon means that people pick it early probably, and then they it's the reason why they go into the black red. Um, or they pick it late, and that means that the color is open. So uh, it's a signal that they use, and because of that, the, their decks are enriched because they found a pod where this color was open. You have to think about it that the difference in the number of a card in a deck uh, may mean that it's because the card is good, but also part of it will be because I drafted that deck on the pod where it was right to draft this deck. And I can't disentangle those two, so we're going to look at them uh, um, in fusion, basically. But it's not only the card power, but it's also identifying the right pod. And hopefully by the time we get the draft data, I'll be able to tell you a bit more uh, about is it important to identify the open color pair and how much bonus you get from uh, from identifying a good color pair. But here we're just going to talk about them in general. Uh, so you have this combination. Uh, yeah. Yeah, unfortunately it will have to be. Uh, but we see that Blood Death Harvester seems to be important. A braid, a luring suitor, that's the 2-3 uh, that when it attacks with one other creature transforms into a 3-3 and gains the ability to uh, pump the team. Uh, the important, the interesting part is Falconrath Celebrants. Uh, that turns out to be one of the best red creatures in the format, and um, definitely I wouldn't sleep on it. It has high win rate. Uh, it works very well, and as you can see, it's also much more predominant in the successful builds. Um, then we have the uh, Flame Blessed Bolt. Uh, another removal, so we have Abrade and the Bolt. Uh, uh, Falconrat Celebrants is the 5 mana 4-4 four, four menace creature, yeah, sorry, I'm, I'm slightly assuming that for these you, most people should know the cards because I can't really explain every single one of them, but if you don't know something, definitely ask because, uh, because why not, you don't want to miss out on some piece of data. What I found interesting in, um, in the, uh, and that links with the data that we're going to see later in other archetypes. But what I found interesting is, uh, yeah, that's a good idea that you can uh, you can use the uh, exclamation mark card uh, format and get yourself up to speed. So I don't have to explain a single one of them. What I found very interesting is that um, Ragged Recluse, the black two drop that if you discarded the card in the turn, flips to a 3-3 three, three that um, uh, pings or drains for one when it attacks. Uh, this card is looking pretty good in Vampire deck, even though it's, as far as I remember, not a vampire. But um, this is your two drop that makes the difference in those decks, it seems. So uh, again, this is a card I would probably draw your attention to. Um, there is Evolving Wilds, so uh, uh, Black Red seems to be benefiting from having a, a copy of that. Um, Shadow Cloak, yes, it is easy to flip with blood. Uh, that's, I think, the main strength of the card. But, it, you know, it, it doesn't necessarily mean that it will be good in the Vampires. Uh, I think that the data does show that it's pretty good in Vampires. Um, 
And again, because it gives you that extra reach for the deck, because maybe you're super aggressive, maybe you, dra you, you, you bring them to four life, and then this one pink becomes much more relevant than a deck that doesn't plan for uh, early kill. We have to think that knowing the speed of the format, black red wants to kill very quickly, and killing very quickly requires several things. And I think that that's why the deck is good. Cheap removal that you can actually uh, combine with your three drops. So uh, let's say playing on the third turn uh, a three mana creature and a bolt, that's an amazing swing for you because uh, you clear out one blocker, you're able to attack with the things that you played in the previous turn and you still uh, put a creature on board. So that cheap removal is very useful for you to clear the board. Then we have in second, uh, uh, to drop the Blood Petal Celebrant, another card that is pretty obviously good in Vampires, but the data confirms it. Uh, Vampire's Vengeance, which is the uh, deal to, to everything except for Vampires, which obviously is good when you have a lot of Vampires. Uh, Blood Craze Socialite, that's the 4 mana 3 3 menace that can grow, which is another good card because it gives you that uh, evasion for the late game um, when you can ping for 5 by sacrificing blood because uh, it gets plus 2 plus 2. And Anya made of Dishonor, which is like five percentage points more likely to be in the decks um, that were successful. Which in this particular case tells me that people just open it, go into it, force vampires, or 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 get it passed later because they were in the right seat. So um, yeah, uh, good way of entering uh, vampires, but also a very good reward because. I'm pretty sure that if you identify that the black red is open on the pod, you may get it slightly later in pack three or something. Yeah, the way for rares and mythics is like uh, uh, higher. So uh, those 5% for a rare mean a, a bit more because of course rares are ta -da, rarer. I didn't weigh it again because I still was not uh, really sure how I should weigh it so that I don't overestimate it as well at the same time. And the last card that is good in this is Reckless Impulse, another card that maybe was not obvious at the beginning of the season that it's going to be good, uh, but it is good and especially good in the, in the Vampire's deck where it's uh, where this 5% points uh, here, more prevalent in, in successful decks. And here we have the, uh, the cards that are not good. And I will go from the back. Courier Buck, just bad, because it seems Windrake is just not good enough. You need your uh, life gain synergies and very often you will not get them in uh, black red. And it's really like in a lot of poor decks and um, and um, uh, yeah. Another Daybreak Combatants, it seems like it's just not a good card um, for, uh, for this particular deck. And generally, I think it has pretty poor numbers. It can be good in some situations, but um, uh, loses. And here we have like a bunch of cards that should be in different archetypes. We have the Rotide Gargantua, the um, exploit card. Um, we have the Lightning Wolf, uh, but we also get one Vampire. So um, so basically this is the one that uh, is a 3-3 and when you have multiple creatures in your graveyard, it becomes uh, a sort of Lurgoif, I guess. It transforms into it and you can discard a card to make it indestructible. And this card, puts up poor numbers, and because it's a vampire, then probably you should um, uh, take note of that. Same, threaten, people put it in their deck when they probably shouldn't. Uh, and um, Grizzly Ritual is doing poorly in this deck because you should have this uh, cheap removal if you want to play the deck. If you need to have the expensive one, then something went wrong, then maybe the pot was... Um, uh... It can, I mean, I can't really distinguish those things. So um, I can't I can't tell. So uh, equations of motion asks: Could the poor rating of this card partly come from an ill-performed pivot? You're a vampire because you tried to build exploit and didn't get there. It might be. However, we're talking about you know the the data set of um, the failed decks are actually bigger subset than um, than um, than the success ones. So uh, uh, the end here will be. Uh, here we have, uh, there's 2,600 decks. So um, we're talking about around, what is it? One, uh, around 40% for each of those. So 35% for each of those. So uh, 
Uh, what is 35% of that? It's around 850, I would say, 850, 900 maybe. No, no, over 900, yeah. Yeah, 900 ish. Decks, not games, decks, which you have to multiply them by three and a half. So uh, around 3,000 games for each. That's the numbers we're talking about here. All right, enough of the vampires. Uh, but yeah, keep keep in mind some of those cards. I mean, some of them are obvious and some of them are quite interesting. And I would like to stress the Rugged Recluse, Reckless Impulse, um, and uh, knowing that this is a bad vampire and maybe knowing that Grizzly Ritual is not a good place for that and that Wind Drake is not good in this format as a, as a vanilla creature. Okay, the second deck that we have, again, around 33% success rate, around 36-7% fail rate, and, and around 30% of middling performances. Very similar to the Vampires. I think it might be just big enough to, to, to get those. Okay, so I think very early people realize that removal is good in this format. And I don't think that there can be a better depiction of that than uh, seeing a Braid Wolf Strike and Flame Bless Bolt as the three best cards in the red green. Um, and this is like, this is super important. Just, just, oh, where am I? Just top three cards being all removal. Very, very um, mm, telling about how the format is. Uh, then two next cards are two drops that are in the theme of the archetype, the Ridge Wolf and the Pub. Then we have Weaver of Blossoms, which seems to be very important in lots of green decks. So I think that this card may be, uh, I will definitely reevaluate it up uh, when I see it. Okay, Halana and Elena are bombs, but just look, how much does it make it win? This is like the real mythic rare. Is there something as a mythic rare? <laughs> there is a mythic common, mythic uncommon. I'm sure that there is a mythic rare. Um, but Halana and Elena are just backbreaking, especially when people don't have a uh, way of quickly dealing with it, which for some archetypes is just like, that's it. Oh, I'm going to put Sigarda's uh, uh, whatever on it. M meanwhile, it generated uh, plus, plus four, plus four on its own. And maybe I have to sacrifice two turns to get rid of it while they are playing their things happily. So, uh, Thank you, Mort Kawasaki. That's a very astute observation. <laughs> um, then you have a couple of four drops uh, in Hook and Mariner and Wolfkin Outcast. Wolfkin Outcast costs six, but I assume that if you play, uh, uh, if you play uh, Werewolf, don't worry. I love that cheesy jokes, Mort. Uh, never stop. Never stop. Um, so Wolfkin Outcast costs two less when you control a wolf or a werewolf, which I assume that it will be a four drop, five four four drop in uh, in most decks. So these two are quite important. Um, this is the fun one. Mountain and forest are more predominant in uh, winning decks, which means that people trim too many lands in red green when they are building it. Um, so basically, people. Um, People uh, try to skimp on the lands, and that's not a good um, that's not a good uh, strategy. And here we have alluring suitor, ballista watcher, rending flame, and sporbic wolf. And I would like to you to notice that sporbic wolf is good in red green because it's a wolf, and that synergy is quite important. Um, well, I mean, I, I assume that you're right that this is an impressive insight that people should put more lands. I think that it is an important. It isn't important. I, having said that, I did trophy with a werewolf deck that had 16 lands uh, and it had plethora of four drops. However, I played three of the uh, sorcery that draws you a card and gives plus one plus O. Oh. So uh, I trimmed one land because I had three one mana uh, cantrips uh, and that's why I did it basically. But I would strongly suggest playing 17. Yep, they did, and they are right, I think. But yeah, I mean, you know, 70 land users are people that are pretty invested. Most of, uh, well, most of them are invested enough to, to install a tracker. 
and the fact that some of them don't put enough lens is um, is some means that we shouldn't ignore that knowledge. Okay, we have the other cards in red green that are not so good, and I start again from here. Important wary prisoner. Even though it's a werewolf, it's terrible. Don't play it. It just has very bad numbers here. Uh, probably should avoid. Card that I was actually surprised to see here is Sure Strike, uh, plus three plus oh, uh, and first strike on instant speed as a combat trick. <clears throat> Seems like this is not what the deck really wants to do. It also doesn't want to play Ancestral Anger. Um, however, I think that um, you basically don't want to play it as a one of. You want to play it as a multiple of. And again, I think it's not a stupid idea to play three of them and uh, trim a land, because then you basically increase the density of your spells uh, while getting quite a good reach in the late game when you can just push through with them um, uh, with um, with trample uh, what else is interesting here swamp which means that you shouldn't splash oh, splashing is not so great in the in this deck uh, don't hurt disciple ruler recruit these two and four drops just don't seem to be playing out really well reckless impulse which was so good in um, vampires Well, trim swamps. Trim swamps. Um, trim swamps from red green. That's I think a a, a good a, a good advice. Um, ah yeah, one thing I didn't mention, but uh, I look at the decks that are main two colors, but I do allow decks with a slight splash to be there. So. Um, you will see some maybe cards of color or lands from uh, of color of the archetype. So uh, so yeah. Yes, Don Donhart is so Haglik is writing Donhart is a human, but RG are more wolf than werewolf does. Um, I think so. I think that um, uh, because lots of the two drops are just wolves. Uh, there is more of a wolf synergy than a werewolf synergy. Werewolves are just a couple of the top ends uh, and probably usually at uncommon. Ari Lux, I think, was saying on Twitter how combat tricks seem to be particularly awful in this set. Well, we're going we're gonna to see some of them, but uh, we didn't see any in here. And we didn't see any in here and i'm pretty sure that in the previous set we did see some combat tricks in the aggressive archetypes and keep in mind these are the fastest archetypes so if the tricks are not great here then where where will they be um okay and fire spawn is not great i was hopeful that this might be a decent card it turns maybe not yes panther x it's odd that the child of the pack is not in the high performance but I think that Child of the Pack was available uh, quite freely in the drafts, and um, it was not as contested as the uh, Blood Tide Harvester. So I guess that Child of the Pack will still be good in those decks. It has a good win rate and whatnot, but it's just that the poor decks also had access to it, uh, while uh, the good decks, the poor decks in Black red that was more contested usually did not get got get the uh, access to the harvester. Okay, pa pa pam. Blue red, which is surprising to me that this is the first winning guest uh, archetype. I I still have no idea how this deck will work, and we're going to figure out in a second. But um, the differences between third and ninth best archetype are quite um, uh, are quite. Uh, Small, so uh, third is very loose here. Mm, it's both, I think. It's both. It shows both power and 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 the because you know, I mean, it's still the, the Mort Kawasaki is saying that uh, I see it more of as an over and underrated risk than a power level list. You have to still think that these are linked to performance, so there is some power component in them, uh, basically. Okay. Blue red, the card that you really have to have is Flame Bliss Bolt. It's like there is an average more than a quarter of a bolt more in the decks that are good than in the decks that are failing. Uh, so yeah, it basically means you probably can't play it with if you if you uh, if you don't get your bolts uh, uh, aligned. Um, 
so second card in the um, in the order is Wandering Mind, which tells you that at least uh, Blue Red seems to be doing what the doctor prescribed. So uh, it really wants to be playing spells. Then we have the Lantern Bearer, which is the uh, finger for spells werewolf, the 2444 mana that uh, transforms into a 4 4, I want to say, that pings for 2 every time you play a spell. So, uh, yeah, another spell synergy thing. This was surprising to me, Wretched Throng, which is the 2 1, the blue 2 1 that. Um, uh that that basically finds another one then we have a braid which is also not surprising so we have both of our uh, prime uh, rib common removal and we have ancestral anger which is the one mana combat trick that draws a card so uh definitely this um uh, this card is uh operational in the blue red or there's a build and you know in a couple of weeks when we get more data i'm definitely going to make an episode on the sub builds of each archetype uh, just trying to look at um, what are the more non-canonical builds and what are what are the canonical builds uh, that are successful. So we're going to look at that. If you're interested in how it's going on, I think that there is uh, the episode available when I did that for Midnight Hunt. And for the fun part, we're also going to look how bad were my predictions from before the format, because I'm going to plot my deck skeletons onto the actual data and see what would be there. Uh, predicted win rate and how bad it will be. And then we have um, Alluring Suitor, Voltaic Visionary, Diver Scab, the three good uncommon creatures. Diver Scab is especially surprising for me, but I guess that you can introduce like a sub package of uh, ex blue exploit, uh, especially when you already want to play throngs because you want to ancestral anger your throngs uh, to, uh, uh, to do stuff. And Lunar Rejection, that's a good tempo uh, card and Rending Flame, a good removal. So you can see that it's all removals. There is a combat trick, and this is a combat trick that you have to play in multiples. Alluring Tutor is great. Um, uh, someone in the chat, yeah, uh, Huglik said, the, the, the card is just busted because it can also ramp you into something amazing. So uh, yeah, I highly recommend it. So there we have the picture. That makes actually quite sense. Very powerful cards plus removal plus some tempo plays. Which cards are bad? And the leader of the bad cards for the blue red is a spell. Lacerate Flash. Really strange that it's um, uh, uh, that it's so low. I mean, strange. Maybe, maybe not strange. Counterintuitive, maybe. But um, uh, it's definitely the big underperformer there. And the second card that is underperforming is the Kessig Flame Breather. The one three that uh, pings if you cast a spell. So. Uh, Adam uh, on 99, is this going on YouTube? It will go on YouTube if I if I manage. Uh, I will try to upload it tomorrow. So you have to keep in mind. It's not necessarily that it's bad. I think that the problem might be that it might be overplayed in bad decks. It still will be played in the good decks, but bad decks might put like excessive amounts of them. Uh, that will not leave space for enough spells, and I think that 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 might this number might be this rather than uh, it being completely bad. It's just like figure out ways of uh, of playing uh, the right amount of spells because if you put rubbish creature, you don't have any good creatures. You end with the classic flame breathers, and probably they're just not enough to uh, ping your opponent out because you don't have enough spells. Yeah, well, I mean, this is what the data found. And again, this will be interesting to look at the sub builds and successful sub builds if we see a build that has uh, multiple uh, copies of uh, multiple copies of them. And interesting also, uh, Storm Chaser Drake is pretty low here. This is the 2-1 two for 2 mana with flying uh, that uh, you draw a card when you target it. And here... Again, since uh, blue red seem to be tempo, I think that this might be a case of, of going too much all in on that card. I think that here in this deck, it just should be treated like a 2-1 flyer and that's it. But I'm pretty sure that people are trying to play it as a um, um, as a Voltron kind of thing when they just like try to play 50, 
well that can target it rather than just slamming for two every turn and being happy with themselves. So yeah, a couple of surprises here. A uh, bunch of flyers as well. Uh, Wonderlight Spirit, Skywarp Scab, uh, uh, and the Screaming Swarm. Uh, the sort of like flying part, it just doesn't seem to work very well uh, in this archetype. So I don't know exactly why. Yeah, Procobrita, that's I think that that's the case. I think that the people try to build around the Drake rather than just use it as a 2-1 flyer, which is perfectly fine as a card. And maybe, you know, occasionally you get like a cherry on top by playing Ancestor Anger on it. Mm-hmm, Carva, yeah. I think that this is the good thing. Uh, Carva said that uh, Drake and Cassive Flame Breather lead down the same trap to play bad spells to make your... Uh, cards feel worth the time yeah okay let's go to the white red the theme of white red is i attack with creatures which is a great theme and also dancing uh so the success rate 30 31 percent so uh, like four percentage points lower than the vampires and and, and werewolves but still pretty decent but 42 percent um, fail rate which is like five percentage points higher than um than the good deck so it seems like this is one of the most um polarized decks when there's quite a big failure rate and and and, and quite um so this question from mad moses was the chill of the grave an over performer no but it was not an under performer so it's somewhere in the middle and i can't tell you from the memory where it is i'm pretty sure that it's like slight over performer but uh for the data i i i i set the threshold of five percentage points there Okay, let's go. So basically, there is a big sort of dichotomy between uh, successful decks and fail rate decks, and there's fewer of those middle performances in here. Um, uh, so Panther X said, Chill seems perfect for the tempo play. And it may be. It may be, but it may be that the um, majority of the people still didn't reach the um, optimal builds and we just don't see the optimal decks just yet. Uh, Adam099 says, what is Wandering Mind? That's a 2-1 flyer that um, when it enters the battlefield, you look at top six cards and you can find a spell. That is not a creature. Okay, white, red, standout cards. Again, Flame Bless, bless Bolt numbers are just through the roof. This is like um, a signature, like you really want your flame bless bolts. I think that they're so important for aggressive decks because, again, they let you do this uh, turn three. I play a creature and I kill one of your creatures, and you can't come back from that in the game kind of situation. Then the second one is a braid. So, hey, pick your removal. This is the removal format. Yes, it is the removal format and particularly cheap removal format. As you can see in the black red. We got a braid, we got the bolt, but you don't see the uh, black removal spells. So um, something to keep in mind. Uh, then third card, my boy, Traveling Minister. Um, I was really high on that card before the set was released. And that's one of the predictions I could damn got right. Uh, so Traveling Minister seems to be important, uh, and you can think of it, it has evasive creatures, it lets you race, um, it lets you win with other aggressive decks because you will gain that couple of life points that will let you finish the game at 3 while they're at 0 rather than you at 0 and them at 2. Um, then there is uh, Mark of Walter, which is the signpost uncommon, so it means that the deck is good at what it's supposed to be doing, so attacking and dancing. Um, uh, but we won't see those uh, signposts and commons as um, standout cards in every archetype. So uh, uh, white red definitely fits that bill. Then we get Falcon Red Celebrants, the 4-4 Menace for 5 mana again, and the Blood Petal Celebrant, the 2-drop that gets first strike on attack again. So we you see that this is a mixture of like Two drops, uh, removal, uh, or early drops, removal, and, and, and finisher in Celebrant and Walter. Mountain, probably meaning that people either try to splash in white red, which they shouldn't do, or put not enough lands. Or both. Um, 
And then we have the suitor, uh, which is the um, amazing uncommon that I would highly, um, highly recommend you playing. There is the Vodalian Epicure, which is a sort of um, one mana. But this is the Raven Inspector for vampires, basically. So yeah, the hopeful initiate is the rare, if I'm not mistaken. That's the one mana training rare. Uh, so uh, this is particularly good in this thing, in the in this uh, deck. Valor's Stance is a combat trick slash removal, uh, and Pillager and Guest is um, uh, a free to trample vampire. But basically, what you can see from this is that white red should be quite red heavy vampires deck with white for uh, the signpost uncommon and for maybe uh, some uh, early drops like Traveling Minister, hopefully Initiate, because the red doesn't have amazing white one drop. It has the Epicure, and that's about it. Um, so yeah, that, that's how the archetype is uh, looking. But I think it's especially important that uh, most of the creatures that you can see, you don't see the three to Trampling Wolf because you won't get enough uh, synergies for that probably to be played. You do see vampires because they don't really need any synergy. They just produce blood and fix your draws and, and let you win the late game because that gives you a bit of reach. Yes, Ranger. I think we mentioned that uh, earlier that um, the playing 18 lands is not a silly idea uh, when you have a lot of blood. And it seems that this archetype wants to have a lot of blood. So, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, Uprising is a rare, and also the uh, Hopeful Initiate is a rare, so you should... Uh, these are actually quite significant numbers when you think about it. It means that it does... The, it, so I treat those cards like these are the cards that probably I should be treating like um, a good reasons to become... To, to go into the particular color pair. Now, the cards that are poor, and here... I think there's a couple of things that are going to be surprising. A, Daybreak Combatants. Uh, this is the 2-2 two, two first strike, 2-2 uh, two, two haste that gives plus 2 plus 0 oh, um, to a creature when it enters the battlefield. This is really poor numbers. Um, Droxkull Infantry, the uh, disturb uh, guide bear that, um, uh, that can turn into an aura late in the game. This one really surprised me that it was so low, but it's not the only... Uh, uh, Presence of that card in the underperformers. Uh, I will give you some spoilers. Parish Blade Trainee, the, tra the, the, the cheap training creature. Not doing very well in those decks. Sigarda's Imprisonment, a card that has really good numbers, but particularly in uh, white red, it's probably not the thing that you want. Ancestral Anger, you would think that maybe a trick uh, that would increase the reach of uh, your deck would be good, but not in this one. Mm, I don't know, Haglik. Haglik is asking, could it be that people try to build the channel decks in uh, in this white red? Planes is a very telling uh, uh, card present in this deck. So successful white red decks are red decks with some white and not the opposite. Uh, this is what this number is telling. Um, and definitely this splashing is also a bad idea. As well, Shield Basher, another the 4 2 that can get um, indestructible by paying 1 1 every turn. Uh, uh, yeah, so I think that, you know, the, the, this is the thing that Ancestral Anger, uh, Mercury of Blue said that uh, he thought that Ancestral Anger could be used to pump another creature to, to get the training train going. But it just seems that it doesn't work. And that can be probably that um, you should have multiples and, and probably hear people try to splash one too. Uh, it's just not enough. I think that, yeah, I think that if I want to play Ancestral Anger, I want to play three and trim one land, basically. Um, no, it's the, the sort of difference in um, number of a card in good decks and bad decks. So this is the percentage points of a card. Like, in this case, it means that there is um, 0.16 uh, Daybreak Combatant more in uh, in poor decks than in uh, uh, good decks. It's just uh, card numbers. It doesn't have to do anything to do with the win rate. 
because of course I'm performing like five five X decks with the O three. So uh, yeah, no problem, boss. Uh, Nerfing present another one that is slightly surprising, but uh, and fierce retribution again, a bit surprising, and a bit not surprising because you definitely want to be attacking, and if you are attacking, then fierce retribution sucks. Same with piercing light. If you're attacking, you don't want to give your uh, opponent life. You want to bolt them, not bolt them after they block your stuff. It, yeah, it can be both. It can be both. It's also maybe you're not that interested in four drops unless the four drops are evasive. And this one is not. It just bumped into one one uh, one one tokens. Um. Okay, well, but that's it. I mean, uh, basically, the, the data suggests that um, just white red is a red deck with some white for good things. And the good things are not many. Traveling minister mainly. Just make a mono red, put some traveling ministers, and, 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 and hopefully you'll get a mark of Walter and you're happy. The one mana to make it indestructible is also not significant. No, it's not, but I mean, it's in the end, people will find a way to, to, to deal with it. Deathbright Sharkman just went 3 0 with Cynic, and that's a rare treat. Although, as I said, this data is all from best of one. So, okay, white black. Um, that's the live game deck. Success rate around 30%, fail rate around um, 42%, so slightly lower success rate uh, than, than the previous one. Um, what's the best card? Traveling Minister, who knew? What's the second best card? Heron of Hope. Yay! But you can clearly see that even though, and uh, you might want to notice, there is no... Um, signpost uncommon in there. I did actually check. It's like not far off here somewhere. Um, the best cards are the payoffs for the uh, payoffs and enablers for live game. So even though the signpost uncommon is not particularly overperforming here, or maybe not available because this is a contested deck in the end, um, all the cards in the first uh, in the first spot, like Minister gains life, Heron gains life, and makes you gain more life from other things. Courier Bet get, does something when you gain life. Kindly Ancestor like, gains life. Restless Bloodseeker does something when you gain life. Diagraph Scavenger gains life, and uh, and then does a beautiful thing. So the first six overperformance are definitely all life gain synergies. So um, 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 so so yeah. Clearly, the, the, the theme works. Uh, then we get Bleed Dry, and Valor Stance, and Fierce Retribution, three removal spells. So in this particular deck, synergy is more important than removal. And that's interesting. Oh, Parasitic... The, the weird thing is Parasitic Grass should be perfect in it, as it, uh, uh, as it basically uh, does both things, that being a removal and... Uh, uh, and... Um, and life gain. But let's let's say one, two, three, four, five, six, six life gain things, three removals, four removals, five removals, six removals, and then a couple of rares that are bomby. Wedding announcement and Edgar Charn Groom. So basically, this deck is all in removal, um, uh, um, removal and uh, and life gain synergies. And point of discussion, which is uh, interesting to see, but uh, uh, basically the cost of paying to life shouldn't be too much for you. So uh, you are you have zero punishment for um, for a divination that does something on top of being a divination because it gives you this one blood, so it gives you two and a half cards. So uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. And the late game is basically draw three for three, and two life is like nothing for this deck because. I think that the I got to 156. So uh, and and the problem was milling myself, not uh, losing the damage in any way. But I think I think at least this this data shows that even though those numbers are small, when you think that like okay, there's a quarter more of traveling minister, and that's already a big number. But I think that they at least show a very consistent picture of something what the deck wants to do. In general, as a trend, and yeah, as I said, in two weeks we're going to go into nitty gritty trying to look at the sub. Um, 
sub-archetype synergies. And what are the cards that are not performing? Shield Basher again, Militia Relier, Mind Leech Ghoul, and Holy Efficient, Grief Rider, just, you know, basically vanillas because their synergies are, uh, are not working very well in this deck. Wedding Security, you won't get enough um, blood to, to use it well. Rot Tide Gargantua, again, not in the same synergy package. Doom Dissenter, not in the sim same synergy package. Distracting Geist, again, not in the same synergy package. Piercing Light, it's just poor removal. Um, Persistent Specimen, wrong synergy package. Pirate Blade Training, wrong synergy package. It's clearly that this deck really wants to focus 100% on the synergies of the live game. The only uh, notable exception is Vampire's Kiss is not, not good enough. I was thinking it might, might be uh, in the early format, but clearly isn't. Yeah, it's really bad. I yeah, mind that um, um, even though there's so much removal, um, a cigar does, uh, cigar does whatever is not uh, there. I think that, you know, adamant will is something that you want to use to, when you're attacking to, 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 to make your creature not trade. But um, here you just don't need that most of the time. You're, you're happy that just clogging the board, gaining some life, putting a heron and then slamming with the heron. That's basically it. Black green. And we're entering, I think, the realm of a deck that clearly doesn't want to do the things that uh, Watsi was planning for it. Okay, top cards. Spore Crawler, Wolf Strike, Evolving Wild, so potentially some splashing as well. Flourishing Hunter, Bramble Worm, Greasely Ritual. Six drop, seven drop, six drop. Weaver of Blossoms, uh, that's basically a ramp spell. Um, then Toxic Scorpion, uh, an early obstacle. Uh, Halpak Piper, uh, that's something that allows you to drop your uh, massive creatures earlier, so sort of ramp as well. Uh, and Hook and Mariner, which is the 4 mana 4 4. Spork Crawler, 3 2, more power than toughness. Flourishing Hunter, 6 6, equal power and toughness. Bramble Worm, 7 6, more power than toughness. Weaver of Blossoms, 2 3, okay, we have a first. Um, Creature with slightly bigger butt. Toxic Scorpion 1 1, Halpak Piper 2 2 or um, uh, 4 4 on the backside, Hook and Mariner 4 4 or 6 4 on the backside. So out of all the cards, of which 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 were creatures, one has big butt. And that butt is one bigger than, uh, than the front, which is like not something amazing. Notably, Signpost as com uncommon also missing. So, um, um, so yeah, there you get the picture of the black green. Uh, the cards that are doing the poorest. Dum, 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 dum. People trying to meme with unhallowed phalanx, and that brings those amazing wins, but, um, um, but uh, no. Also, notably, swamps are not good in that deck. So basically what you want to do is probably playing some kind of a green deck with value and ramp and not focus on the big pots. Uh, also, Sporbeck Wolf. Notice that this is also here. This is a 2-4 on your turn, so clearly a big butt synergy card. Not doing very well in the deck. Another Undead Butler, also bigger butt, technically. But there's a few cards here that are uh, not doing very well. But basically, Unhallowed Phalanx is particularly telling in terms of what the deck uh, wants to do. Uh, so that's where Sharkman, yes, it gets outclassed. But in the red-green, it was actually on the good list. So um, it seems that being a wolf is pretty useful, but being a 2-4 is not. It's probably also that, you know, it's big butt creatures should be big butt creatures on their turn so you can block with them because if you make a big butt deck, then you sort of want to be defensive early and then take over the game. But this one like, oh, it can attack as a 2-4 and then not block because it's a 2-2. Two -two. So yeah, it's like sort of doing the opposite of what, uh... yeah. 
Okay, blue black. Um, I run out of my tea, so I'm going to take a quick five minute break uh, and 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 get myself a tea done. Yeah, exactly. Um, so Pantrex is saying that the, the sample and common and the catapult are good payoffs, and you don't get those consistently enough. I think you're right. I think that. I think that this is the kind of a deck, if you want to really build a big buds deck, you should sort of speculatively pick maybe uh, the one four. And if you see the second, then you can start thinking about building around it. But uh, blue black, uh, the most drafted deck. Again, I'd like to remind you that it was definitely overdrafted in the first week. So I'm I'm assuming the win rate of it is, is going to increase um, in the coming weeks, I think, because the deck is not bad, but it's been just over contested. And I think people wean off it uh, slightly, but around 28% uh, success rate, around 44% fail rate. And that's probably because people go into it when it's uh, over challenged on the, um... oh, you should see my previous stream, uh, Miguel, to Hertz, uh, to see a phenomenal uh, blue black deck. I first pick uh, Necro Duality and, and, and then did some obscene things with it. Um... So yeah, I think that the, the problem is the deck is really good. It's been over um, overdrafted, and 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 that's why people uh, uh, lowered the win rate because they weren't into it when they shouldn't have. But let's look at the standout cards. And first thing, Skull Scab. That's the signpost and common. So we already get a very decent um, uh, a very decent uh, feeling that yes, it 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 is good at doing what it should be doing. So at exploiting. Um, so uh, you should draft it as 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 what you planned for it. So yeah, uh, bleed dry. Second thing, because removal, as we noticed, is good in those decks. So yeah. Um, then wretched throng, which is quite surprising because uh, I'm on the fence with that card, but it seems like it is actually doing well. I'm going to show you some extra data on it uh, at the end of the uh, presentation. Lantern bearer, because that's just a genuinely good blue card. And it's a very good sacrifice fodder for your exploit um, uh, exploits. Um, then parasitic grasp another uh, another removal. Thirst of discovery. I think that um, card draw is really uh, essential for this deck. And then we have the doom Descenter, another feed for the exploit. Um, Diver scab exploit, fell stinger exploit, biolum egg exploit fodder, undead butler exploit fodder. Uh, Rot tight gargantua exploit and runal rejection, the sort of like tempo card that lets you uh, go to your mid mid range slash late game when you should be much better. So yeah, it, you know, also like it's it's a very very nice um, uh, combo when you can lunar rejection small creature at the end of their turn and then play rot tight gargantua on your turn to make them sacrifice something valuable. Okay, let, let's try. It. I'm I'm not sure about this. Ginger thing. Oh, oh, it'll do. It has to. The underperformance, and not many of them. Ragged Recluse is one. Uh, and that was the card that was good in the uh, black red. And it's pretty bad in here, which should make you think, okay, I probably, probably very specific uh, vampire card, really. Uh, it not not um uh, the values on those graphs represent how much more of a given card is there in good decks versus bad decks. Yeah. Um, self of entomber is the sort of creature looter, and uh, it's just not good. That's the base baseline for that. And mind leech ghoul, that card is also not good. If you are interested in more thorough analysis of blue black sam black did it in their last episode of the uh, drafting archetypes and he also came to the conclusion without using data that much that mind leech ghoul is just not good enough because if you play it on two it's just a bear if you play it late it's not very impressive and you have to sacrifice something that actually is a creature so uh, yeah um, so this is not a good uh, uh, exploit uh, thing. You want expensive exploit cards and cheap uh, enablers and not vice versa. Uh, yeah, don't splash here again. 
and uh, these cards are just not in the uh, not in the uh, team. But worth noting that Mind Leech Ghoul and Self of and Tumor are just not good in this deck, basically. And then the Ragged Recluse, uh, again, is not. Uh, Ted Jordan, I, uh, I think that also um, uh, Jason uh, ILTG is uh, agreeing with you. But the problem is that you won't identify it from these generic data sets. Uh, hopefully, when we are going to go for the granular sub build analysis for uh, for particular archetypes, which depending on the luck, we, I might start next week and do five of them and then do the other five uh, in two weeks time. Hopefully we will see something there, but uh, yeah. I mean, obviously the um, mind leech goal might be good at some, in some games, but generally, generally it's, 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 it's underperforming. White blue, success rate twenty nine percent, which is actually higher than the previous deck, if you notice. So uh, again, we're talking about a deck here that has a slightly bigger delta between uh, fail rate and success rate, and fewer of those middling uh, performances. So what does it want to do? Let's see. Best card: Roxkull Infantry. Uh, remember that it was pretty poor in the white red. Well, here it's definitely the home. Kindly Ancestor and Traveling Minister, some life gain, but also some um, disturb, uh, 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 some disturb synergies. And Traveling Minister, you know, if you want to Voltronize one of your creatures, you might as well give it plus one, plus oh, uh, until end of turn. Uh, Brian Comer and um, Lantern Bear, another to disturb creatures. So clearly, yes, the deck uh, is doing uh, what it's supposed to be doing. Uh, then we have the Fierce Retribution as the uh, uh, removal. Uh, Storm Chaser Drake in this deck is good, is overrepresented in good decks, uh, because you will have so many things that incidentally you can chuck on it, so uh, so it's pretty useful. And there is also not much of the X1 punishing, especially X1 flying punishing, uh, is all, all but absent from the format on the playable level. Diver's Cup, we just a solid uncommon that is probably good in any blue deck uh, because it's a nice tempo swing that lets you you know go to the late game when you should be able to uh, take over the game and lunar rejection has the probably similar kind of um, uh, role that lets you live a bit longer and then you have circle of confinement another removal and Catilda as a bomb that will probably should be a, a reason for you to going into that deck if you draft Catilda just to, you, know, you have you, you have to try forcing at least the a blue white if it's possible stay open but you know planes so it, you want to be more white than blue uh, if you play the white blue um wedding announcement another good bomb and uh, i think that yeah this is one of the best cards in the set uh quietly because it was i mean everyone knew it's going to be okay at least but it's actually much better than okay and uh, another removal, Sigarda's Imprisonment, uh, uh, and two card draw spells to fuel you uh, in your shenanigans. It is a bit odd. It is a bit odd. I'm not going to say no. But it may be that it's super highly overrepresented in those 4-3-3-3 uh, three, three, three decks. Thank you for the tip, uh, Carpa. Yeah, no, no, no. It's a good, it's a good tip. Just um, yeah, I I was definitely uh, the analysis took me a bit longer yesterday. I was planning to do it yesterday night, but at two in the morning, I I just ended up with okay. I cleaned up my data. Now I have to make the presentation, and that didn't work out very well because it was two in the morning. So I just had one hour to cobble it together, and I couldn't make exactly what I wanted. Um. I will definitely try to do it for the next one, for the next set, whatever it is, because of course I don't know. Okay, the poor the poor performance and the Wanderlight Spirit is the thing that is performing poorly in blue in general. Uh, so uh, I think that you should not plan around this card. Then we have the the, the, the training package and Griff Rider, uh, Shield Basher and Parish Blade Trainee. Also doesn't work very well. Um, then again, another 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 vanilla sort of flyer that uh, doesn't seem to be working very well. Dreadlight monstrosity also underperformer in most of the blue decks. 
Uh, this card, Supernatural Rescue, I, I thought might be good in the Aura deck, but it seems not to be. So I stand corrected. The interesting ones are Heron Blessed Geist and uh, Steel Clad Spirit, because you would think that these are the homes for that particular card. Yeah, Griff Rider is, is pretty poor. I think that, you know, this was something with uh, Coven in um, in the previous set, in Midnight Hunt, uh, that you rarely have more than two power in those decks that can attack. So that might be one of the reasons. And also, you don't want to kill your opponent very quickly. You want to build this grindy kind of gameplay when you eventually over overcome them because you have so much card advantage because... You lose a creature, you still get some value out of it, basically. And that was my also experience. So Shadow Cloak says that they didn't try their rider uh, training in a single time in the whole format. I did, and I won those games, but mainly because I had like two riders and a traveling minister or something. But um, uh, but it's not been trivial to... Um, uh, to activate them, and especially once you are slightly behind, this card becomes awful, just awful. Don't worry, we still have the training deck in, in front of us. Actually, yeah. Oh, just uh, just uh, hammering this one across. Heron blessed Geist and Steel Card Spirit just just show slightly poor numbers. They are not terrible because it's like on borderline of what I would consider um, uh, to show in those graphs, but. They are definitely not the priorities for the deck. If you have other cards that, especially the ones from this list, definitely focus on those before you before you go into the Heron Blessed Geist. Um, white green, not pretty low success rate, like a quarter. Um, here it was almost thirty five, so like almost nine percentage points difference uh, between. Uh, between white green and, um, and 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 the vampires, this is also like a pretty highly um, drafted deck because it's in friendly colors. So it doesn't show good numbers, and it doesn't perform particularly well. So um, you have this dual kind of thing that uh, it's overdrafted slightly compared to the other archetypes, and it's not really doing uh, amazing things. Uh, standard cards, spore crawler. Which should be maybe a slight surprise here. Sigarda's imprisonment, okay, removal, removal. Hook and Mariner, Mariner, uh, Resistance Squad, Traveling Minister, uh, Dormant Grove, Massive Might, Angelic Quartermaster, Fierce Retribution, Sigarda and Paladin, Infestation Expert. That's again zero training cards, zero, zero, and one. Two werewolves, basically. Uh, so, yeah, I think that this shows that to build a successive white green, just forget about training. You might have like an incidental training somewhere here and there, uh, but you can focus on, 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 on werewolves and human synergies, basically. Because resistance squad is here, um, and hookland Mar mariner is a human on the, on the side. Uh, this one is a human, uh, this one is a human, this one is a human. So uh, you have enough of those um, uh, um, you get enough uh, you get enough humans from 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 those um, mid-range werewolves uh, to trigger a resistance squad in the late game um, and, and and win like that. Uh, and of course traveling minister is good in every deck because it's awesome. Uh, but definitely, this is the archetype where the data suggests that uh, what what's he planned for us to do training just not very good. And I don't remember if we will see some training cards on the uh, uh, bad performers deck uh, side. But I would like to also point the dormant grove. This is like showing you that uh, you know you don't need the training to 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 get the guardian paladin to uh, to activate its ability. You have quartermaster dormant grove, and you can put the counters like this rather than um, trying to train things and, and, and basically 
not be able to win any single game when you are uh, when you are behind. Underperforming cards, militia rarier. Uh, so this card might have been good if training was good, but uh, training is not good. Late to rest. I thought highly of this card before the set was released. Turns out, nah. Uh, Droxkull Infantry appears again on the list of the uh, of the uh, uh, poor performance. So really, you, you should probably only consider it in the blue white. And then we get Apprentice Shooter, Griffwing Cavalry, Griff Rider, Cloak Cadet. We have four training cards in the poor perform underperforming cards in white green. Um, um, yeah, so basically this indicates to me that the theme of training, abandon it when you draft white green, focus on mid-range kind of aggro that can go slightly tall with some other means and maybe get some counter synergies rather than focusing on the training. Uh, Adam said that it doesn't surprise it, uh, them. Well, I guess Adam, it will be him uh, because training is difficult for people to figure out effectively. Um, yeah, and but I think that there's a problem. I, I, I talked about it in my previous seminar. Uh, imagine you play the one two uh, training guy on turn two. Then on turn three, you play something with two power or three power or whatever. Then on turn four, you can turn your two drop into a two three. This is not like amazing. This is not incredible. So um, possibly uh, that's the reason why it's just not uh, not doing so uh, amazing. Um, okay. Oh, we got to the last uh, archetype. And this is like a quarter of the uh, drafts turned into successful ones. So five wins or more. And fail rate is around 47%. So big difference. Like this is um, this is an archetype that we clearly didn't figure out. And uh, there is doubt if that even can be figured out. Uh, and part of it is that, you know, it's the, the cards that would maybe make it good are, are just hard to get yet. Maybe it will become slightly better in the later format. Uh, so Adam says that Griff is a very reasonable in some decks and cuttable in others, but I think people just auto include it. I think you're very right in there. Okay, standout cards for blue green. Wolf Strike. By far. Because this is the only reasonable uh removal that is available for the uh for this particular deck. Then we have the uh, Valspawn Spider, Lant uh, the signpost uncommon. Lantern bearer, flourishing uh, hunter, bramble worm, massive might, lunar rejection, glorious sunrise as the as the busted rare. Taxidermist, Wretched Throng, which was actually a surprise for me in here. Infestation Expert and Paxong Pup. Uh, removal, uh, brick removal, um, uh, sort of removal, a bomb, and the rest of the things are creatures. I think that, uh, no, we haven't seen Syncopate anywhere, and, and, and we won't, I think, because it won't be also in the underperformance, which means that the card is just solid, but is not like something that will uh make or break uh, how you play um Mad Moses it uh, you're asking if vile spawn spider is actually good I don't know if it's actually good I just think that maybe it's also a signal for uh, a blue white being open blue green being open but yeah it, it it does look like um uh blue green more than doing the self mill theme wants to ramp and and cast big fat creatures like the flourishing hunter and the bramble worm and hopefully we'll get a couple of like bombs that um uh, that will let it uh, win the games uh which cards are underperforming don't hurt disciple uh i think that there's just no human synergies in there so uh playing just the vanilla 2-2 is is not the way to do it uh, we see the wonderlight spirit and skywarp scab again it's just uh, probably not the world for the 2-5 flyer because it just doesn't do enough damage and the 5 in the back does not protect you from the uh, annoying threat. Uh, so I think that that's the problem with it. And you pay five, 5 mana for it. Mulch is an underperformer. I still hope that I will figure out a way of um, of, um, of, of playing the uh, card. 
Repository scab, I guess that since you want to play creatures, getting the spell from your graveyard is not so great because you don't you shouldn't have spells. Uh, and you should not sacrifice creatures at the same time. Then, surprising a bit, is Chill of the Grave and Siphon Essence. Both cards have been pretty good, but just they don't seem to perform very well in, in this particular deck. So I guess it's less of a tempo deck, but more like clunky creatures uh, that are big and just kill. Um, I think I, I wouldn't mind playing Mulch if I had been playing some kind of a Sultai version of the deck when um, I also get access to a Blood Fountain or something like that. Uh, and Adam, again, is, I think, uh, in my opinion, right that um, it's easy to put Mulch in the wrong deck that doesn't need it and shouldn't play it. Yeah. I think that the, yeah, I think that uh, you know I'm I'm a bit jealous because I always sleep when Sam is uh, streaming or well, most of the time when Sam is streaming I'm I'm, I'm sleeping but uh, I know that uh, his streams are awesome. Uh, no, we haven't because I didn't do that particular uh, graph carva. As asking if we saw the overall distribution of success, middling failing decks in Vow. I did not. <clears throat> Millipede is not an underperformer. And I've seen some situations where it was good. Because if you play a lot of creatures and you trade them off and you play the Millipede as the top end of it, it will be a big thing. And that big thing might be just enough if you have say, Massive Might to push the damage through. When it becomes 11-11 and they jump it and you just Massive Might it, you might just uh, one-shot uh, an opponent. Uh, it will have problems and um, I think that now after this... Um, well, after this thing, we can actually take a look at what is it uh, good against and what is it bad against and... Uh, yeah, it just doesn't deal very well with the super aggressive decks. And uh, th th that includes white, red, uh, black, red, and red, green. So basically red is its uh, problem with maybe a slight exception of the uh, blue, red. Uh, I'm still waiting for myself to uh, build the deck based on Dollhouse and then and, 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 uh, reanimate Millipede and, and make it like a massive construct. That's that's my hope for this format. I want to build a dollhouse deck, and I want to, uh, and I want to reanimate Millipede using it. And you know that that would be the deck where I can get a mulch, because I can mill lots of creatures, play the dollhouse, and reanimate my Millipedes as haste, uh, whatever big big things. It would be interesting to do. But my two dreams for the format is Runa Stormkirk Sultai deck and 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 some kind of a blue green. Dollhouse concoction. Ah, okay. That basically covers it. Just took two hours. Yeah, no. I mean, of course, I will mill the dollhouse. I I did with the with my uh, necrodomin ne necro duality deck. I did exactly that. I only had the undead butler, and I played it three times, and I milled the necro duality twice. Uh, and the third time I played it when Necro Duality was in play, so I couldn't even mill it. So yeah, and I didn't play it one turn, and then I drew the Necro Duality. So yeah, uh, I was smart not to fall into that trap because that would be three times in a row that I milled it, which uh, is like my my biggest uh, um, anger with the repository scab is that they make a format when all the spell synergies are for non creature spells. And this thing just looks at uh, instant sorceries. Don't thank me yet. I'm not done, but uh, we have last two slides because I always uh, put those in this first episode. So I decided to continue with it. I looked at the cards that are played in the multiple copies in the deck uh, most frequently. And you wouldn't be surprised that those two cards are Ancestral Anger is one of them. I looked at the win rate number by, or win rate by copy number and Basically, you want to have four of three, four of them to 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 make this card worthwhile. 
uh, you don't want to play one. It's pretty poor. And two is not, not impressive either. I think three allows you to cut a land. Uh, there were just, there was just um, uh, too small sample size for that. Already at four, it's a pretty small sample size I might, I might want to stress. Um, so yeah, people didn't try to build around it uh, aggressively enough, I think. Um, and the second card is Wretched Throng, which for some reason had massive, massive uh, amount of decks that had four copies, unlike the uh, Ancestral Anger, which makes me think that this one was more highly contested than this one. And actually, Throng seems to be good in multiples. It has decent win rates when it's three. And what I think we've seen in the data so far is that um, um, it's not only good in the uh, blue-black. It's good in some archetypes outside of blue-black. And I don't remember by heart, but was it here? Yeah, it was in blue-green. Wasn't in blue white. I, I hope. I, I, I damn hope it was not in blue white. It was in blue black as one of the top performers. And was it in blue red? No. No. Yes, it is in blue red. So actually, except for blue white, um, Throng is performing in all blue uh, archetypes at a reasonable level. Whew. All right. Oh, by the way, yeah, don't play one throng. <laughs> Just like, don't. No. Vanilla 2-1 is not something that you want to play in your deck. Just cut it. Put a land instead of that. God. Just anything. Don't play one. And it's been a surprisingly large sample size for that. Um, okay. So, um, I'm done with today's uh, presentation. Um, I'm really happy that you've been here. So first of all, yeah, as always, thanks to the uh, 17 lands team. I'm pretty sure that uh, Fire Realm Misnomer already went to some DIY projects, so uh, they're not here anymore, but they were here in the beginning. Uh, uh, he is the creator of 17 lands. Hululu, I think, also was here momentarily. Very, um, uh, I have very highly recommend following all three of those on, on Twitter. And um, and I would like to thank Diogo Japinto. I always thank Diogo because he helped me setting up my stream and uh, is a generally good person. So yay. And yeah, if you have any questions about the uh, seminar, now is the best time. 